Well, we start a new series today entitled Unwrapping Your Spiritual Gifts or Your Gifts. And uh, it's, it's getting that time of the year, right, where we're thinking about gifts. Anybody got your shopping done already? Crazy people out there? Nobody. Uh, <laughs> Anybody started shopping a little bit? Yeah, a few of you started shopping. Yeah, so, you know, the, the time of the season is really a time where we, where we want to give gifts, and that's a good thing. We want to cultivate that. But God is concerned about you getting the gift that He wants you to have. Isn't it nice to know that God's got gifts for us? Isn't that kind of a cool idea? Yeah, but I don't, think we, um, I don't think we access or take advantage of the, God, of the God-given gifts that He has. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture, the first 10 verses of the first chapter of the book of Corinthians. There's two books of Corinthians, first and second. Actually, when you read them closely, you discover that they were probably book letter two and letter three or letter four. There was letters written prior to them, prior to those letters, that didn't get put into the Scriptures. So what it tells us is that the Corinthians had a lot of affection, a lot of attention from the Apostle Paul, the writer. Now, that could be good or bad. Right? So if you're getting a lot of information, that means that you know you're fortunate or maybe you need a lot of help. The believers in the town of Corinth needed some real help. Um, and in the first chapter, he tells, he tells them that God's got some really good things in store for them, but he wants to kind of strengthen their faith. I think we could learn some stuff from that. Would you like your faith strengthened? What if in this holiday season, you were literally able to prepare yourself for the year ahead? Would that, would that be a good gift? If you could kind of unwrap in this holiday season kind of a plan for 2017 that would make it more successful than ever, um, would that be something worth engaging in? Yes? Three of you think so. And we're good. So the rest of my challenge is to get the rest of you on board. <laughs> um, so let's look at several things. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, under the first point of your notes, that God has unwrapped gifts for you. Unwrap gifts for you. And so if we're going to unwrap those gifts. Look what he says in the third verse of this first chapter. He says that the God made all the, how many? All the gifts and benefits of God our Father and the Master Jesus Christ be, be what? Be yours. Be yours. How many of the gifts? All the gifts. So what that tells us is that God's got multiple gifts he wants to give you. He wants them to be yours. I believe that we as believers do not live up to our potential. We don't live up to the potential, the life He wants us to live, the things He wants us to do, and what He's called us to be. And so in this series, Unwrapping Your Gifts, I want us to imagine going to another level spiritually that literally requires us to be engaged in unwrapping the things that God has for us. I believe that's, that's a pretty critical thing. Have you ever, uh, can you remember what you uh, got last year for Christmas? A few of you can. How many would have to really think about it to even remember? Come on, how many are like me? I have to really think about it. How about two years ago? Really have, how about three years ago? Uh, like you can't even remember who won the Super Bowl last year, right? Right? Unless it was your team. <laughs> right? And what happens is, is oftentimes in the giving of gifts, they become rather trivial, really, in the light of the big picture. The thing about God's gifts is they're not trivial. God's gifts are impactful. In fact, I could rattle off all the, God, all the gifts that God's, God has given me. Now, I know that I'm kind of into this God thing, but I could rattle those off pretty quickly, right? Right now, on the fly. Catch me any time I could do that. Why? Because the gifts that God gives us are significant. But yet, I wonder how many of us could say, oh, yeah, the gifts He's given me are, and you could rattle them off. Or we'd be kind of wondering, well, I'm not sure what the gifts are. And so if we in this season could kind of come to this place where we're more aware of what God has given us and how to unwrap those things, that would be kind of my desire and goal for you, is that you, we would go there together. To understand that, the title of today's message kind of opens us up and says that God wants to give us gifts that are unlimited. He has unlimited resources for us, a gift without limits. Now, that's, that would be amazing. First point under number one is Jesus made it clear that he had unlimited gifts and resources. He made it clear. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells his followers right off the bat early on, he says, I came so that they may have real and eternal life. Circle the word more and circle the word better life than they ever dreamed of. I don't know about you, but I can dream up some pretty good stuff. But Jesus came that we might have real and eternal life more and better. So circle the word more. By more, that means quantity. By better, that means quality. 
that God wants to give us more life, and he says what that is, real and eternal life. And so our life isn't just here and done, it's here and there and thereafter. It's life that keeps on going. I did a funeral last week, I'm going to do another funeral this next week, and, and uh, people are often surprised when I tell them that I actually enjoy doing funerals. I do, I kind of like doing funerals, and it's not morbid, really, honestly, it's not. Um, the reason why I like doing funerals is because people are kind of like, they're very um, cognizant of bigger things. At a funeral, you're moving away from trivial perspectives, and you're longing for significant perspective. And so I love to be able to talk to people when they're really ready to hear that, when they're kind of primed because they're so aware of the fragility of life that they're longing for someone to tell them about something more than just this life. I mean, you think about it, I say this often at a funeral, is that death, did you know that none of us get out of this alive? Right, that we're all, we're all going to die, right? I mean, I mean you know, the, all of our clocks are ticking. God has a, a time in that we're all, it's all going to come up for us. The day we don't know, but it's going to happen. I mean, the way of your death is uncertain, the, but the fact of your death is inescapable. It's going to happen. And so I say if death is life's greatest certainty, wouldn't it be a bit foolish to not plan for what lies ahead? That'd be silly, wouldn't it? I know it's coming, so why not plan for it? Jesus just said, you can plan for it. I've planned for it. I plan on giving all those who come to me real and eternal life, more and better than they ever dreamed of. Sign me up, right? How about you? Jesus wants to give us unlimited life. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he goes on and tells his disciples a little bit more. He says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so here he talks about unlimited light. Now, I don't know about you, but in my 24 hours, I still got some darkness. How about you? Right? It still gets dark on me pretty predictably, right? Even now earlier than ever because the time change. Jesus isn't talking about physical darkness. He's talking about spiritual darkness. He's saying, literally, I can give light to your life that you know the spiritual steps you need to take. I, I, I really don't have times that I'm very dark and I don't know what steps to take. Those are far and few in between for me. Why? Because he's given me light. And if there's some darkness in my decision making, it's because of me, not because of him. Because he's lightened my perspective. Now, that hasn't always been true. That had to be unwrapped. That had to be unpackaged. That had to be figured out. But, but it was there. He's, he gave it to me to figure out in my relationship with him. He has unlimited life, unlimited light. In chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus goes on and tells them, Jesus said to them, uh, I am the bread of life. Um, the one who comes to me will never go hungry the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. What does he have? He has unlimited nourishment. He's saying, I want to nourish you. I want to nurture you. You see, part of our disengagement from the true spiritual life he wants from us is we seek nourishment from earthly things instead of nourishment from heavenly things, from what God has for us. But God's got unlimited resources. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know? Uh, I'm... Um, I'm very aware of my limitations. Anybody else? I mean, I don't probably, you know, very many days don't go by, and I'm a little, I'm pretty cognizant that I've got some financial limitations, right? There's things I just can't do because I can't afford it, right? Anybody else like that with me? Okay. Some of you don't have any financial limitations. You're just blessed. Uh, most of us, though, we got some financial limitations. You know, that, you know my, my wife says, you know, we can't be out of money. I still got checks, right? No, she doesn't say that. I, I'd be the one more in danger of saying that. But, but we do. We, we, we have these false, false idea of resources because we have plastic, right? I can't be out of money. I still have credit cards. Um, we have these false idea of resources, but the truth is we have financial limitations. You don't respect that. You're in trouble. Right? We've got, I don't know about you, sometimes I can be going so fast, I recognize I got energy limitations. I mean, some of you don't believe I have li energy limitations, but I do. I do. Um, I've got a garage gym in Mariposa. When we've started several garage gyms, there are times where guys get together and exercise together, and we've got three of them that are operating in Merced, uh, doing well. Um, my one in Mariposa is not doing so well. It's, uh, I had four guys for a while, and then one moved away, and one took a job out of the county, and the other one doesn't like to exercise. It's, you know, it doesn't usually work very well. And the other guy can only come once a week. So I'm, I'm like, wow. So I'm working out in Mariposa once a week. You know, I try to go out there by myself. It's hard by yourself, right? 
So I'll come down once a week to exercise with the guys in Merced, one of the, one of the gyms here in town. And uh, they're like, they kick my butt. I mean, they're like doing timed exercises, and then they go run in between those timed exercises. And I'm the guy in the very back going, wait for me, guys. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got limited energy. Anybody else got limited energy? Maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. Is anybody else like that? Energy? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got so many things that people want me to do. My calendar can't handle them all. I mean, like, there's all this stuff, and my calendar just can't, it just can't squeeze in there. I got a limited calendar. We got limited time, limited 24 hours. It's just crazy, right? Isn't it nice to know with all of our limits, we have a God that doesn't have limits? Isn't that amazing? We have a God that is limitless. Jesus was clear that he didn't have limitations. The Apostle Paul, number two in your notes, was also clear that God did not have limitations. In the book two of the Ephesians, in chapter three, verse 20, he says, now to him who's able to do, what are the next two words? Circle those. Immeasurably more than all we ask or... He's saying that God isn't even limited by your imagination. You can't even imagine what God has. That's incredible. Then he goes on and says, you know, um, all power and glory be to him, uh, to the church and Jesus Christ for how many generations? All generations for how long? Forever and ever. He's a God that has unlimited stuff, and that stuff he wants to give to us, to reveal to us. And so, Based on kind of that premise as we start this conversation and start this series, do you want more of that unlimited stuff or are you just fine and dandy with your limits? How many want some more unlimited stuff from God? God wants to give you some things that you are not yet unwrapped. He wants you to unwrap those things. As we begin to do that and begin to face our limits, but God's unlimited resources, we begin to step into something brand new. In order for that to happen, number two in your notes, Roman numeral two, is we've got, to begin to, we've got to begin to understand that there are three priorities that must be kind of incorporated into our life to unwrap the resources that God, God has for us. Three kind of critical priorities. Now, these priorities are things that we believe deeply here as a church, and, and uh, I mean, you know, I just, uh, I live them. I live them every single day, these three things. I just walk in these things, eat, drink, sleep, these things. So many of you do too, but there's many of us that, that don't really know what they are. And so on the website, we've done some work. It took us a while to do this. You're going to say, wonder why when you see it, but it's pretty simple, but we want it to be simple. And it's kind of a, it's called a spiritual growth plan, plan, because I don't know about you, but if you've said yes to Jesus, God's desire is that you move in such a direction that you consistently make spiritual progress. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, wouldn't that be nice, right? <laughs> to live together and to grow and be stronger, more loving people. Um, that's God's desire for you. And yet so many of us fail to realize that. Has God ever kind of fallen off your radar? You know, you're kind of going along and you get kind of preoccupied by your own stuff and God kind of gets, you know, more in the shadows and you kind of forget about the God thing. Does anybody else ever kind of lose perspective of God? What if you could retain an awareness of His presence more than not. I mean, just kind of tip that scale. If it was just you're more aware than not aware, what if you could tip that scale? What if you could begin to move in and out of every day with an awareness that God's actively involved in your life and wants to be doing things in you so it can be doing those very same things through you? What if that was a tangible, everyday experience? Would that be a, would that be a good gift? I want to give you that gift. I want to give you that gift to, to learn how to make God such a priority that it begins to reshape the way you think about all of your choices and all your decisions and all your relationships. Some of you aren't even sure you want God that much. You aren't. You're not sure because you've got this, this bent toward independence that wants to do its own thing. You're not even sure you want God around that much. He might rain on your parade. <laughs> I guarantee you he won't rain on your parade. He will lighten your world, and He will lighten your world, and He will change literally the, the things you crave and desire and make everything brighter and everything more vivid and everything more real, because that's who He is. 
And when we really understand that and embrace that, it changes the way we live life. That's what God wants for you and wants for me. Let's look at verse 4 of this, this text. So we're going along in our, in our passage, in our text. The Apostle Paul says about, um, about this new perspective, the first thing that he wants to give us in these new priorities is he wants us to unwrap the gift of our new spiritual identity. He wants us to unwrap the gift of our new spiritual identity. <coughs> verse 4 says, um, I can never stop thanking God for all the generous gifts. So he goes back to gifts here. He's just very started the conversation. He's already talking about gifts again. The generous gifts he has given you now that you circle the next phrase. What does it say? Ready, set, go. It says, be. Now that you say it now, everybody, belong to him. You belong to God. He's saying, I want to give you a different perspective of who you are. A new, a, the first gift he wants to give us is this gift of this new identity, literally that we are somebody different than we used to be, that we belong to him. Seneca was a, um, a Roman philosopher. He was a contemporary of Jesus. Uh, he said something that I really like. He said, if you want to escape the things that harass you, what you need is not to be in a different place, but to be a different person. Isn't that good? If you want to escape the things that harass you, and I don't, I'm not sure what harasses you, but if you want to escape them, what is needed is not to be in a different place, but to be a different person. You see, I, I like that because you and I are so circumstantial, right? We're, we're, we're so like, circumstances are bad, so we're bad. You know, circumstances are negative, so we're negative. We just let circumstances kind of rain on our parade, pull us back from being the people he wants us to be. And Seneca's saying, and God would say, no, I want you to be a different kind of person in those circumstances. So literally, you bring the change. You, you enact the difference in those circumstances because you know who you are. And I think a lot of times we forget who we are. Because if you are not cultivating and refining your true spiritual identity, then you are distracted by a false identity. If you're not cultivating and developing your true spiritual identity, then you are distracted by a false identity. Nathaniel Hawthorne in the Scarlet Letter said, um, No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. You remember those parties that you didn't want to go to? <laughs> How many are the party animals? You, you want to go to the parties, right? And we don't want to go to the parties. Come on, vote no. Vote no on parties. There we go. One, one, two, there we go. Don't worry. Have you ever thought about Christmas parties and parties in general and why some of us would want to go and why some of us wouldn't really want to go? I think, have you ever wondered on your way into a party, I wonder what they will think of me? Have you ever wondered that on the way into a party? Or on your way out of the party, I wonder what they thought of me. Have you ever really? Because, because I think that parties challenge our identity. I think they do. I think we're, we're mixing and we're milling around with other people. Sometimes people we know, sometimes it's half, it's employees. We know half of them, but we don't know their spouses. So we're mixing around with people. Maybe you're in a party, you don't know anybody, right? And you're wondering, I wonder if they'll accept me. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And we go into that and it tests us. It tests our identity because we wonder in a conversation, you can tell someone's you know, their mirage, their false identity, their pretense, because they will rattle off. Most of us base our identity on one of three things. Either what we own, who we know, or what we possess. We usually base our identity on, on one of those three things. And so that's what will kind of be churned up in a conversation is what you own, who you know, or what you do. And those things kind of create that sense of who we are, but that's not really who you are. You're someone more than what you do, than who you know or what you possess. In 2 Corinthians, same letter, second letter, same group of people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, look what he says. He says, this means that anyone who circles the next phrase, it's the same as the one earlier, right? Belong to Christ Jesus has become a, what, circle it, underline it, new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. He goes, I want to make you somebody brand new. I want to be the difference in you. You, because you do it, you belong to who? I don't know about, about you, but I think that that can kind of create almost a dissonance in us because we don't want to belong to anybody. We're way too independent for that. 
but I belong to just me. In fact, maybe some of you are even offended because at a party, someone will say, who do you belong to? And right, they want to know who you're married to, right? Or who'd you come with? And you might point to oh, him or her, right? Someone. But you even are offended at that because you don't belong to anybody. I don't belong to nobody. I just happen to be married to him. <laughs> right? But there's that sense of who do you belong to? Some of you go to a party and they're the party that lets the kids go along, right? The kids can go. But then all of a sudden there's that awkward moment when someone says, who do those kids belong to? You're going, I don't know. It's time to go, kids. <laughs> what does that do? That, that kind of infringes upon our comfort zone because we think maybe I'm failing as a parent, and that says something about who I am, and so it means I'm not a very good person. But our, our, our identities are fragile, aren't they? Our identities are fragile, and, and, but, but God says that you belong to him. Now, this is going to require something. The learning curve here is we've got to learn how to be dependent on God. Okay, this was it. Let's, let's blank the notes if you don't have it there. Is we got to learn how to be dependent on God. We develop that dependence on Him, and all of a sudden we start realizing, wow, I'm, I'm dependent on Jesus. He's the one that I that I belong to. And so, in that process of learning that, God, I begin to say, ask different things about who I am and the behavior that I do and the choices I make. And that's what we're suggesting as we make some new priorities. What about your priorities in living? Are they affected by the fact that God's in your world? Uh, should be. Should be. If the Corinthians, these body believers, these letters were written to, they were struggling to kind of make sense of how do we live out what God wants us to. In fact, they were so kind of entrenched in their old behavior that there are some things they had not yet given up that they needed to confront. And so they were struggling, so the Apostle Paul confronts it for them. In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he talks to them about some of their sexual choices and talk about something that can, that can distort and mar your identity is what kind of sexual choices you're making. If you're making unhealthy sexual choices, it will affect your identity. It will either give you a distorted, perverted identity, or it will distort your real identity. And so that's where they were. So he confronts that throughout the chapter. In verse 19, he says, Do you not know, have you not heard, that your body is the, what does it say? Temple of the Holy Spirit. Where does he live? Because they've made a commitment to Christ, who is in you, whom you've received from God. Look what it says. Read it with me. Ready, set, go. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Here's the crazy thing. God had such a priority to give us the gift, the most important gift in our lives, that God chose not to send it through FedEx. Not, not you know, UPS. Uh, not the postal service, God chose to hand deliver his most important gift, and he brought it himself, that gift of knowing you. And so what Jesus did is he brought you the gift of his life for your sin, his righteousness for your unrighteousness, his sanctification for your desecration. And God said, I have bought you at a price, and you no longer belong to you. You now belong to me. That it's, right? it's beautiful when it's accepted. It's repulsive when it's rejected. Because some of us don't want to belong to anybody. Because we want to carve our own path, do our own thing. And so we're bent in that direction. And God says, that's because you're struggling to learn to live dependently on me. And he wants to woo you and draw you into a place of utter dependence on God. Say, I belong to you. Therefore, I'll begin to rethink my choices and my decisions so they are not just about me. Because I guarantee you, you're going to have a really hard time unwrapping God's gifts for you if you're all wrapped up in yourself already. When we're all wrapped up in ourselves, that's all we see, that's all we want, that's all we do. And you're going to have a hard time breaking out of that so you can start living the life that God wants you to live, which goes beyond our imagination unmeasurable. What do you want? Do you want your limited screw-up package of mess? Or do you want God's unlimited, unmeasurable set of resources? Want to make a trade? Jesus said, you can make that trade. I'll give that to you. So here's, here's part of the deal. 
is on our spiritual growth plan, right? So you can look at this on the website. You can go to our website. You can pull up. You can go to Next Steps on the website, and under Next Steps, you've got some little icons, and one of them says Spiritual Growth Plan. And so if you click on that little plan, it'll give you this little sheet here. Isn't that something? It looks like what you have in your program. Wow, that's unique. <laughs> How about that? So here's the deal. I, I'm just thinking that, you know, why not? Why not move away from kind of, you know, um, me meandering spirituality? Have you, are you a, a meanderer spiritually? You kind of meander here and meander there. You know what the opposite of true discipleship is? Drifting through life. And we say that we're a loving community of growing disciples because that's what Jesus called his followers, disciples. It's used way more than Christian. Christian is used three times in the, in the New Testament. Disciples used 269 times. He called disciples, people that would be learners, disciplined in their pursuit of being like Jesus. And so um, in that pursuit, I mean, God says, I want, you to, I want you to do that. The opposite of true discipleship is just kind of drifting through life. God doesn't want you to drift. He wants you to live on purpose. And so with this little plan, we're saying that why not for 2017 make some incredible, courageous plans to not stay where you are in your spiritual identity, but to unpack that and to figure out who does God want me to be spiritually? Wouldn't that be amazing for you? How many would be open to that? Let me open to a spiritual plan that you create over the next 13, 14 months. Actually launch into it in January. Rather than wait for January for a New Year's resolution, let's be proactive. What do you think? Let's start now. Why not? Huh? <laughs> there we go. I'm fishing. I'm fishing. <laughs> okay, so here's kind of one of those things that, that God wants to do. He wants us to begin to think differently about ourselves so that at that party you go to, right? You go to the party and they say, hey, who do you belong to? And I'm, you know, I'm the social bug, so I'm going to parties and I'm fluttering around. And they go, who do you belong to? And I go to the girl over there who's talking to one person in the corner, right? Because she's kind of the non-social non person. She's in the corner talking to one person. But what if this season, when you go to those parties, some of them you don't want to go to, I know. But what if the way you behaved at those parties reflected your true identity? What if it reflected a spirit that loves others, an ability to listen well to others rather than be preoccupied by what's going on in another conversation? What if it had the ability to zero in and express care and concern for the person in front of you rather than wishing you were talking about the person behind you? What would happen then? If how you behaved at that party, would it make anybody think or question or ask, I wonder if you belong to him? Wouldn't that be amazing? If the way you behaved, the parties you will attend, most of you, <laughs> what if they said, oh, I wonder if that person belongs to Jesus because, gosh, they're so sweet. Man, they're so caring. They're such a good listener. I wonder if they know God. I think that'd be phenomenal, wouldn't it? God wants to do that. You know how that can happen? That, that happens. That doesn't happen just naturally. It doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. It happens whenever you make a decision to start investing in your relationship with God. So you'll notice in your spiritual growth plan, there's three, little, three major areas. There's connecting with God daily, there's growing with others in community, and there's serving with others. Okay? You see those things? The three things. You see them on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen. The first one has a red arrow. The second one has a green arrow. And the third one has a blue area. Do those colors mean anything to you around here? What, what do they look like? Right? What do they look like? Yeah, the circle thing. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that circle thing. Remember? Those things, that's just that's who we are. Connecting with God, growing with others, serving as an overflow of those things. God wants you to do not one, not two, but all three of those things. And when you do, you can unpack God's best gifts for you. And when you don't do those things, you like set God's gifts aside and are distracted by other things. And so I don't know about you, but if you aim at nothing, I believe this. You aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. People don't plan to fail. They just fail to plan. And so why not set a course? Why not plan today and kind of pencil in some things you're saying, you know what, you're right. I'm not being very proactive about my spiritual journey. I kind of meander through my faith. I kind of drift along in life. What if I got serious enough about this that I begin to say, these are the things I will do? Anybody want to do some things? 
some spiritual things? Huh? God wants us to say, it's time to, to get a move on. It's time to say, you know, I want to get more serious about this. Why? Because literally my identity, if I'm not cultivating it, I'm distracted by a false identity. And the best way to cultivate that you belong to Jesus is to meet with him, connect with him, love him, soak him up every day. So on that little thing, look at it. So connect with God daily through, what does it say? Prayer and Bible engagement. Do you see that on your on your? Is your thing the same thing as in my head, right? Through prayer and Bible. And then it says, what and when? Is, are we right? Is it? Yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So what and when? So this is where you kind of just fill in the blanks. You can say, in fact, the back of the page has an example of that, okay? So you'd fill out something you would do. Like you might say, through prayer and Bible engagement, I'm going to try to be thankful every day. Thankfulness is a form of prayer. It's gratitude. Okay? I'm going to be thankful every day. I'm going to do that soaping thing. In, in fact, today I'm going to be teaching people how to soap how to have a daily time with God at 1 o'clock. I'm going to spend the afternoon meeting with some folks, helping them know how to accomplish this exact thing. So you can write that in there. That's the what. And then the when. You might say, you know, like Pastor Jeff, I'm going for 5 a.m. You might say, I don't want to be like Pastor Jeff. Go for 6 a.m. You know, I don't even want to be that close to Pastor Jeff. Go to 7 a.m. We'll make it p.m. I don't care. Right? <laughs> Just pick a time. Sometime, any time, but make it a consistent time. If you don't make that time consistent, you will not consistently figure out God's best gifts for you. And that gift is your relationship with Him, which fosters this new identity. Oswald Chambers is probably one of the most trusted Bible commentators who has ever lived. He's passed away now. He said, it is impossible for a believer to stay right with God if he will not take the trouble to spend time with God. Spend plenty of time with God. Let go of other things. But don't neglect Him. Does your daily rhythm invest in your relationship with God? Or does it neglect your relationship with God? I'm proposing, based on 2,000 years of practices in the Christian church, based on all the recorded scriptures from the, from the man himself, Jesus, and his followers, that that is a time that is critical for spiritual development to happen. Andrew Murray was a uh, pastor in South Africa in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And he said, late 18, early 1900s, actually, I'm sorry. He's a son of a missionary family. He said this, Dear child of God, let us never say, I have no time for God. Let the Holy Spirit teach us that the most important, the most blessed, the most, what's the next thing? Profitable, is it there? Time of the whole day is what? Is the time I spend alone with God. Pray to the Lord Jesus, who in his earthly life experienced the need for prayer. Pray to the Holy Spirit, who will impress us with this divine truth. As indispensable to me as the bread I eat and the air I breathe is communion with God through his word and prayer, whatever else is left undone. What's the next thing? God has the first and chief right to my time. My surrender to his will, only then will my surrender to his will be full and unreserved. Isn't that good? I don't know about you, but whenever I am full and unreserved, my surrender to God, those are my best days. Those are my best moments. That's the place I want to live, not visit. God's connection, your connection to Him, should not be something you visit. It should be something you live. And that won't happen without saying, I will make it a daily practice. And that's what I'm good at. That's what we're wanting and choosing to say, we will help you with. All you got to do is say, I'm going to make it a commitment to do that. Under every one of those bullets, there's a class you can take one of them this afternoon about being, being a better disciple, discipleship experience. There's a class you can take, and there's all the dates of the next season where I'm going to be doing that class. Then you can write, then how am I going to do that daily for myself? Where will I meet? For me, it's at the kitchen table, or it might be in a, in a little spare bedroom on a little easy chair right next to my desk. I've got a sp spot I meet every day. Between 5 and 5.30, I'm there, like clockwork. You can too. This isn't something just for me. It's for you.
Make your plan. Make your choice. The second one, move down to sentence number two. The second thing that God wants us to do is unwrap the gift of a new spiritual family. Unwrap the gift of a new spiritual family. So let's look at verse um, 5 and 7 of this. He says, uh, through him, God has enriched your church. Circle those words. God has enriched your church in every way. This confirms what, what I told you about Christ is true. You, now you have every spiritual gift you need. That's pretty cool. He's saying, you've got within your church, so them is the church in Corinth. For us, it's us. Within your church, God's, he's blessed us. You've got everything you need right here. You just got to access it. Take, take a step and say, I want to begin to participate in that. Well, how do I recognize that? You recognize that you are not made to live independently, but dependently, interdependently on others. In chapter 12, this same, same first Corinthians book. He says, now you are the body of Christ. And what does it say? Each one of you is a part of it. In Romans, it says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body. What does it say? The next phrase. And each one belongs to all the... What? You're saying, first of all, I belong to God, now I belong to you? <laughs> this is really pushing your independent buttons, aren't they? You see what God's wanting to do? He's wanting to break us out of our American idea of independence and bring us into a spiritual identity of interdependence. And so on our little, our little grow with others in community and the little arrows that take us over and says, I'm going to commit to a small group. And then there's a what and there's a win. So what kind of group? It might be a couples group, a, a men's group, a recovery group. Right? We've got so many different kinds of groups. Pick one and begin to invest in a relationship because God wants you to break down the facade. You know the party thing when you go in saying, I wonder what they think of me, and you go out thinking, I wonder what they thought of me. You know what a good small group is? A place you don't have to ask that. That's what a thriving small group is. And if you're not there yet, it's just you're just not developed in that group yet enough. Because when you've got a kind of group that loves like Jesus wants them to love, you don't walk in wondering if they're gonna, what they're going to think of me. You don't walk out wondering what they thought of me because maybe I shared too much or I talked too much. A good group, if you talk too much, they'll tell you. A good group will because you get past that place of all these superficial interactions and you start dealing with stuff that matters the most. And you would want them to tell you because you want everyone to share and everyone to disclose and you want to cultivate that real environment. A couple weeks ago, uh, probably three now, three or four, I shared that I had some suicidal ideology. Was anybody here when I shared that? A couple people were. Some of you got freaked out and uh, you know, gave me your phone number. Call me anytime, Pastor. Thank you very much. That's so, so sweet of you. Um, you know, a few things happened in that. Number one is that I, I, I prefaced that with saying that that's not, that's not me. I don't, I don't have suicidal ideology. And so that was kind of a weird thing to have it and for it to go on for uh, a couple months. It was weird. It was different. And I finally realized I'm under attack. I'm under spiritual attack. And when I recognized where it was coming from and I confessed it to a few people, it was gone that fast. Precip precipitated for two months, confessed it with trusted friends, and was gone overnight. What happened? I stepped into the reality that I was no longer going to be independent with those thoughts and feelings, but I was going to be interdependent on others, and it literally crushed them in a moment. God wants to bring you into community because community is what you were made for. And so when you want to live outside of community, you're living outside of what God wired you up to need and to subsist on. And so the sooner I recognize that and step into that, the sooner I get to unpack the beauty of community. I, one of the reasons why I drive down to uh, um, Merced on Monday mornings early, 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 squirrely, i got to get up at 4 o'clock to get down here um, so I can be at the garage gym in Merced once a week is because I can walk into that garage and I never wonder what they think of me. I'm surrounded by seven, eight, or nine other guys 
that I don't love them with all their heart. Do you have that? You were made to need that, but you've got to cultivate it or it won't happen. If you don't figure out how to get real and get honest with people that say they love God and want to build a foundation of trust, then you've not yet gone to that place where you can bring whatever worry or strife or foe or difficulty into that space and be loved through that space. God wants you to have that. You want to put that on your spiritual growth plan? <laughs> Why not? Why not fill out that little page and, and say, I want to write down where I'm going to begin to build that kind of community to unwrap my spiritual family. The last one, the last one is the, the third little arrow is serve with others in community. And so this is through your gifts, your talents, time and tithe, kind of the resources we have to use and give away. And there's a what and there's a win there. You see, whenever we begin to kind of recognize that God made us to be p- people that are serving and giving away ourselves to others, we break the grip of independence and self-absorption. We break away from being all wrapped up in ourselves and begin to live with other an other perspective, a God other and a people other perspective. Eleanor Roosevelt said that when you cease to make a contribution, you begin to die. When you cease to make a contribution, you begin to die. Why? Because God made you to contribute. He did. He made you to contribute. A couple of verses there. Uh, the first one in uh, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians um, says, uh, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help ourselves. Um, look what it says in 1 Peter. It says, each one should use whatever gift he's received so he can serve himself, uh, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms, right? Obviously misquoting those verses, right? Isn't it interesting that God did not give us our gifts and our, our abilities to serve ourselves. But that's what culture says. So the question is, do you want to start going counterculture? Do you want to start moving away from a culture that's all about being wrapped up in ourselves and moving into a culture that says it's about being wrapped up so much in Jesus that literally he changes the way we see ourselves and the way we live this life? I hope you will join me in that. How many think you could fill out this spiritual develop growth plan? How many think you can? Awesome, excellent. About 10, 15, anybody else? Yeah, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of us said, I want to grow like never before. I want to unwrap God's best gifts for me. I want to discover what it means to thrive and flourish in my faith. Wouldn't you want to be there instead of wherever else you are? Huh? Amen? Amen? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, uh, we recognize, Lord, that we are, we are either developing the identity that we have in you or we are distracted by the identity that the world gives us. And God, I would ask that you would supernaturally enable us, Lord, to not be timid and to hold back and to, to cower away from spiritual practices. But Lord, literally to put them down in black and white and say, I will press forward and move ahead in being the person you've called me to be. I will recognize that you've given me a gift as a new identity, as a child of God, that I belong to you. And that I belong to your family and I need to function as a family and care for others and be cared for by others. God, you've given me gifts and abilities that when I don't use those, we don't thrive. We don't go and do the things you want us to do. And so, Jesus, give me the courage to go where I have not gone before and to live there like never before. If you've never said yes to Christ, but you recognize that's, I've described the kind of life you'd like to be living instead of the one you are. If you've never said yes to him, then just whisper this little prayer. Just say, dear, dear God, dear Father, I confess my sin, my selfishness, and my independence. And I ask that you fill me with your presence. Teach me to be dependent on you and interdependent on others. As much as I know how, God, I want to learn to live for you. To unpack and unwrap 
all of your gifts intended for you. In Jesus' name, amen. How you doing? Doing good? So before you take off, run out the door, go shopping, go to that party tonight, just turn to somebody and say, hey, what are you going to take away from you, away from the service today because you came? Would you ask someone that before you go? God bless. Have a great afternoon. See you next week.